Hi, welcome to our 1.30 press conference, Advances in Tsunami Warning and Forecasting Since the 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami. And Monica Allen from NOAA Communications is going to introduce the panelists. Thanks for coming, everybody. We have a great panel here today, an international panel, to talk about tsunami research and the advancements that have been made since the devastating 2004 tsunami. And I wanted to just give you my name again. It's Monica Allen. I'm from NOAA Communications. You'll see me in the press room. If you need anything, please come up, and I'll try to get you whatever you need in terms of materials. We've developed a lot of materials at NOAA about this. So uh, there's some that's loaded on the virtual press room. There's some fact sheets that I have here. And there's more, and uh, so I'm happy to get you videos, fact sheets, information, and, and, and I hope you enjoy our panel and hope you stay around to ask some questions. So I'd like to introduce Eddie Bernard, who is the, who is the, he was the head of NOAA's laboratory in Seattle during the tsunami. He's now a retired scientist and has a great story to tell about what's been going on in the last 10 years. And Chari Pacharachi, who is here from I'll let Eddie introduce yeah. the details on that, so I'll turn it over to Eddie. Thank, Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Monica. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to uh, in introduce our panelists um, for this event. Um, Eddie Bernard, I was uh, director of the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab for NOAA at the time of the tsunami, and uh, I've been wor working on it ever since, so have a good corporate history of what happened in the United States following this. A massive tsunami. From uh, originally from Sri Lanka uh, is Chari Padarachi. He's now a professor at the University of Western Australia. And Kinji Sataki is a professor at the University of Tokyo. And uh, Kinji is uh, probably the most famous Japanese tsunami scientist in Japan today. And then uh, Vasily Titov, uh, director of NOAA's Center for Tsunami Research, so basically took my place when I retired but uh, has done a whole lot since then, so. Okay, let's, uh, our program for today is quite short. I'll give you a quick overview about what's happened in the last 10 years. Chari will talk about the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. Kenji about the 2011 Japanese tsunami, since it was a major tsunami in, after the 2004. And Vasily Titov will talk about the future. And then we'll have questions and answers from your journalists. Okay. Uh, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of work done on the assessment of what the exposure the, of the world is to tsunamis, and the latest the United Nations report uh, has estimated that about 60,000 people and $4 billion in assets are at risk each year, exposed each year. So this is much larger estimate than we had in 2004. So number one is the risk is greater to the population of the world, uh, and certainly the assets that are exposed are, are greater than we originally thought in 2004. I'd like to uh, introduce this whole concept by reminding people that the Earth, Earth Sciences process, which is this whole meeting is about these 24,000 scientists have come together, are working on one of the three processes here. Either they're observing the, the Earth, they're trying to understand what, uh, what these observations tell us about the Earth, and in most cases they're trying to predict what will happen next. And so it's in that context that I think it's important for us to realize that science evolves uh, over time. And to try to give a parallel for the tsunami science since 2004, we will talk about the development of a new observational capability, measuring the tsunamis in the deep ocean, and how that has led to an increased understanding in forms of uh, um, distribution of the energy once it's created. And then finally, that leads to forecast products, such as flooding. This wasn't possible before 2004. And, um, one of the most significant things, uh, we, uh, a global observing system was put in place following the 2004 Indian Ocean, and now there are eight countries that are contributing as well as the United States to this 60 buoy effort. In 2004, there were six buoys out. In 2014, there's six, six zero, a, a factor of 10. But let me just uh, show you that this is a product that came out as a result of all this work and it illustrates what we can do today in terms of forecasting. Oh. Um, a tsunami generates, is generated in the ocean and then it's like a, 
dropping a rock in a pond. But unlike the rock in a pond, the waves are, are then guided by underwater mountain ranges and valleys. And so as a result, this rock that was dropped in the pond, it doesn't go uniformly out. And so this observational system that we talked about enabled us to quickly assess the nature of any tsunami, and this was a good example, but you see that most of the coastlines of the Pacific are not affected, but wherever you see bright reds, those are the areas that need to be concerned. So instead of alerting and warning the entire Pacific, we now can do a much smaller portion. Now once we get down, if you're say you're a mayor of a coastal town, probably the first thing you want to know is, is what's going to happen? And we've come up with a tsunami magnitude scale that is available today. All these things I'm talking about are possible today. They're not necessarily in operations, but they are possible as a result of the science that's been done. So once uh, you're the mayor of this coastal community, you know, oh my goodness, it's a big tsunami. Uh, I see here that, oh my goodness, I might be affected. I'm, if I were the mayor of, say, uh, a town in Hawaii, I see some big red here, so I should be alert. The next product that's possible that could come out is to tell you whether it's going to flood or not. So six hours before this tsunami ar uh, arrived in Kahului, Hawaii, uh, it was clear that it was going to flood. This is, the this is the evacuation maps that exist for tsunami evacuation, and the red is this flooding that took place during this particular tsunami. So now, if you're mayor of that city, you say, oh my goodness, I've got flooding. I need to evacuate my people, and which is what they did, and that was the correct call. The third product that is possible today based on this technology is currents, because they, tsunamis induce very, very strong currents. And uh, in the last 10 years, we've elucidated this, studied it, and now we can actually use these products to forecast what the would be. And in this fairly hard to see diagram, this is the flooding part of Kahului, but this is the port. And if you notice these strong arrows right here in the middle, the currents that would be going through here is about 10 knots, and that's an enormous speed. And so if you were the mayor of this city, you might say, oh my goodness, I'm, uh, I've got some really strong currents here. I should advise my ships to go out, uh, my vessels to go out to sea. And then, based on this current guidance here, you certainly don't want them to go here, so you guide them to go into this area. So these are the kinds of products that are now possible, and we can give to communities, and then they can take this information and make correct decisions based on their local community. So with that, uh, as a sort of a general summary of our, these are major scientific accomplishments that have occurred in the last 10 years, in part because of this process of observing, understanding, and predicting. Now I'd like to turn it over to Shari Padirachi, who will talk about the Indian Ocean. Sorry. Thank you, Eddie. So um, I'm going to talk about a personal experience in, in Sri Lanka during the Indian Ocean tsunami. So if you actually look at this satellite image, you can see the beach. And this is a road. And along here is a railway line. And I was driving along that road on the day the tsunami happened. So, and I saw lots of people coming onto the road. They were very distressed. And I carried on. And once I got to a point where that's a railway line, and the road intersect, I found a boat on the middle of the road, which didn't allow me to go forward. And at that time, I knew it was a tsunami, but it was, I had done research in tsunamis, and I also knew that how many waves have come. Usually, a tsunami, as we experienced it, as we had known 10 years ago or before, <coughs> Maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, there is three or four waves will come, and particularly, particularly in Sri Lanka, where it's never experienced a tsunami, which uh, I came to the conclusion I was safe, I was not going to be affected. But I was wrong. This is where I was standing 20 minutes before the wave came over, and this is the railway station, you can actually see the way went over. There were seven meters of water where I was standing 20 minutes earlier. 
And that was totally unexpected because in my mind, I was safe. So, I couldn't go to the beach because that's my particular idea that day. So, I had to turn back and go back to Colombo. This is about 50 kilometers to the south of Colombo. So, everywhere I went, people are still scared and there were traffic jams. I said, don't worry, don't worry. There is no more waves coming. But all the way through, there were more waves coming and there were more waves coming. So this was a big puzzle to me. I was thinking, here, my scientific knowledge, I said there is no waves coming. Now we are one hour later, two hours later, and there's still more waves coming. So what was happening? So this is one of the ones that I ran away, had to get my uh, feet wet to escape the incoming waves. So where I was was just about here, and we had a tight uh, water level recorder. So this was uh, quite interesting in, in itself that we didn't have a tide gauge in Sri Lanka, and I was instrumental together with US scientists to get one, this one established about three months before the tsunami. It's one of the few tide gauges which was transmitting data in real time. So you can see the system. And here, when we come closer, we see that we were missing some of the data in here where the tide float actually got stuck inside the tube and did not record it. But fortunately, we had another instrument further offshore and I was able to reconstruct the waves. And what this showed us was that the biggest waves came three and a half hours later than the initial ones. And here, I thought that I got to the site, onto the beach, about 20 minutes after the first waves come, and I thought the waves have come and gone. And the biggest wave, remember that wave which went over the top of the railway station came three and a half hours later. Well, where did this wave come from? Well, we have now established that this wave was a reflected wave. The wave went past Sri Lanka, it was reflected, it hit the island chain of the Maldives, which is basically like a wall or a mirror, and then reflected it back. So it took three hours for those waves to travel after the first one, go to the Maldives, and then come back. And that's a uh, importance of how long these systems will last in terms of time. So when we look at Sri Lanka, uh, in, in Western Australia, where I live now, we have the same system. We have the first waves in here, but you can actually see there's a band all the way through large waves, 18 hours after the first waves. And those waves basically traveled across the Indian Ocean, got ref reflected from the Mascarene Ridge and the island of Madagascar, and came back. So it took 18 hours for those waves to come back through the reflected waves. So what I want to highlight is that the effect of the, the land masses and these systems operate through a whole basin and the topography is important. I will now hand over to Kenji. Okay, so I'm Kenji Stake. I'd like to talk about uh, uh, earthquake and tsunami experience in Japan in 2011. Uh, so the 2011 uh, Tohoku earthquake or, and tsunami, this was the largest earthquake we experienced in the past uh, in, in Japanese history. And we didn't anticipate such a huge earthquake in Japan. Uh, but in the meantime, this earthquake, 2011 earthquake, was the best recorded earthquake in the, in the world in subduction zones. I come to in a minute. And in terms of casualty, uh, we, have, we lost nearly 20,000 people, and more than 90% of the victims are due to tsunami. And also, as you may remember, that this tsunami caused a Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power accident. Okay, <clears throat> as I said, this is the best uh, studied earthquake uh, or tsunami source, tsunami, uh, because uh, in Japan we have Okay, so we have many uh, GPS stations on land, and in, that, in addition to this land-based station, we have several uh, ocean bottom GPS or GPS acoustic station, or repeated uh, bathymetry sounding. 
Okay. From this um, a summary observations, we just uh, recorded uh, <coughs> the seafloor movement of 50 meter, which is a uh, scale of this uh, swimming, you know, Olympic swimming pool. And in the area of like uh, two, uh, four to 500 kilometer times 200 kilometer, I was told that this is equivalent to the I area of Ireland in Europe. So you can imagine that uh, the area Ireland, entire Ireland, uh, Ireland moved about uh, the size of the Olympic, you know, Olympic swimming pool. So that's what happened in in the source area. And the important thing is this is not really estimated. This is really observed or detected. So that gives a very good idea what's happened. And that's why I said this is the best uh, well-studied earthquake in the past, in history. Also, this tsunami generation and propagation was also recorded. We have, uh, uh, we have ocean bottom pressure gauges um, and hooked in, uh, on the cable. So the data, we have the bottom pressure gauges uh, the ca in cable, and that is about uh, 70 kilometer offshore and only 40 kilometer offshore. And then this, this is a GPS nearby. Okay. And shown here in horizontal axis time. So what you can see is because this is bottom pressure gauges that measure the pressure, water pressure. But because this is placed on the ocean bottom, this also can record the seismic shaking or ground shaking. Okay. So what this recorded is just ground shaking or earth earthquake. And before this ground shaking start ends, uh, the sea level rose about two meters. Then in about 10 minutes, it rose again about three more meters. In total, it's about five meters of tsunami generation is recorded within 10, 15 minutes. And this tsunami uh, propagate toward land and then just reach the land on the coast about in 30 minutes. Okay. So probably this is the first uh, you know, uh, instrumental record uh, just in uh, evidencing the recording, the generation and propagation of tsunami. So based on that record, and also the, uh, based on some seismic information, J uh, JMA, Japan, JMA stands for Japan Meteorological, Meteorological Agency, equivalent to NOAA. Uh, they issue the tsunami warning in three minutes after the earthquake. Okay. So they issued very quickly. And because of that, many people uh, evacuated to high ground and saved, survived. But they issued, they had issued very quickly in three minutes. And as I said, this earthquake is so huge that the entire process took more than a few minutes. So in order to issue the tsunami warning in three minutes, they couldn't capture the entire rapture. Okay? So they just only detected the initial part of the rapture. Okay? So the earthquake size was underestimated. Because earthquake, was, earthquake size was underestimated, the tsunami height was also underestimated. So they issued the tsunami warning in three minutes, but uh, forecasted height, tsunami height is three to six meters. Okay. Um, but actual tsunami is much larger. Okay. And it's about twice or three times larger. But then because of the uh, previous, uh, oops, I okay, we'll go back. Yeah, because of this kind of information, based on this uh, data, uh, they updated information uh, in 28 minutes. Okay, uh, oops, sorry. Oh, one more? Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, right. Okay, so they, just, they could update this just, uh, in, uh, that forecast tsunami height. Okay, so yeah, that's what's, okay, so they, let's, let's move on. And because of that kind of experience, oh, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, the Japanese government is now um, constructing the more uh, dense cable network consisting of like 150 uh, stations, uh, the pressure bo bottom pressure gauges on five different cables. Okay. And this is, they started a few years ago and uh, we, complete, we expect to complete in a few years. We have, out of five cable networks, we have installed two so far. Okay, so that's just uh, the current situation that's moved to uh, hand off to Vasily. All right, so I'm, uh, again, Vasily Titov. I'm, uh, I work for NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The reason I'm saying that is that 
you, you heard this, very distinguished scientists of our tsunami community, the, the, and the way Eddie put it is they, they're observing, they're analyzing. So how do we use it to predict? That's what we do in NOAA. And I'm no NOAA scientist that trying to get the, all this information into, into uh, uh, what we call forecast. You know, we, 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 we observe, we analyze, even if you've heard this, we have challenges of, in, on the way. And now we can predict. The big story is that we can do it now. And that's, that's a big change from 2010. Actually, I should go to my slides. Uh, and and when, the way we predict, it's we're producing the forecast, tsunami forecast. It's just like weather forecast. We, we, we collect the data, and then we produce the forecast of tsunami impact at the coast. You know, we want to do it before tsunami hit the coastline. And that's a huge challenge. So I put some challenges there, the, 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 you know, the main challenges that we face, and that's the accuracy. And you've heard from, from uh, you know, some, some of the uh, stories of how do we get you know, this, this analysis into accuracy of the models. But in tsunami, unlike in, in, in weather, the timing is, is a huge challenge. So we have to combine this all science into, and distill it into, into the products that Eddie also mentioned that, that are very fast to produce and, and easy to analyze. And that took a long time. But now we, we're at the point that we, you know, what, what I want to do like in five minutes quickly show you that it, it's, it's, it's difficult and it took a long time, but we, we are now at the point that, uh, that, that we can do this forecast, but even bigger story is that we still have to do a lot to make it such that, that you know, the most people, oh, you know, it would be great to have all people saved. We probably, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, you know, pie in the sky challenge, but it's good to have challenge that's, that's difficult to reach. So anyway, I put this in a timeline. How, what, what, is, what does it take in terms of time for us to develop this capability now, and I'm, I'm talking about science being implemented, all these you know, the observations on this analysis uh, into the forecast system. Modeling is a big part of it, and when we had the capability a long time ago in 1975, in fact, Teddy Bernardo sitting right here, produced this animation that's on the, on the, um, on the left. Uh, by 2000, we actually had capability to do much better simulations, I mean, much higher res resolution models that could be used for the forecast. But in 2004, there, there really was no forecast to speak of. You know, Japan had a operational forecast capability, uh, uh, but locally only, and, and nobody else produ predicting actually the amplitude uh, forecast in real time. The reason was that the accuracy, we, we didn't know what the accuracy of this forecast is. And this, the, what, what I highlighted here is this decade of the natural disaster reduction that was from 1990 to 2000 before Sumatra, which we spent really to get the, the accuracy of the forecast down. Okay? So we, we invested the scientific community time into getting down the accuracy of the models so that we could, they can be u uh, useful for the forecast. And, and we've done it by going into every single tsunami event, which is red dots on this timeline, and, and measuring everything we could. And you've heard a lot, of, you know, the Chari was part of this, uh, Kenji was part of it in terms of observation. And they, in parallel, the observation capabilities were being developed such that we can't only, you know, t take the observations and then later analyze with models. We want to get this observation in real time. And, and DART capability that NOAA has right now, DART is a deep ocean, assessing and reporting of tsunami. It's the, it's the data uh, system that sends, that's specifically designed to measure tsunamis, and it, it can do it in real time, and it can, fed, it can feed models with this data. And that was the next decade that's, that's just passed. You know, we just, at the end of this 10 years, uh, and, and this 10 year anniversary of Sumatra gave us a good opportunity to reflect on, 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 on how did we do that, you know, how, how we did in, in, in terms of this, developing this into capability. The, the forecast is really a cycle now. Now we realize it's not just one event. You go from the, you know, from the time f uh, of the earthquake that generated tsunami, you analyze that, you, you, pr you produce the first analysis, you, you, you uh, uh, use your model for, uh, 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 for predicting the impact, but then you do it all over again when new data is available, and that's a cycle. You know, you, you again, you observe, you analyze, repeat, and and you know the, w this this repetition gives you better and better accuracy. How do it? You know, in terms of the speed of the forecast, the the, the other challenge, uh, we we are now uh, let me go back at the point that we can do this forecast uh, with, in about an hour. 
So what does it mean in terms of the tsunami warning? It means that the, the tsunami that's, that's far away, that's the ones that you know, we call far field tsunamis, uh, for example, Hawaii impact uh, from, from pretty much any tsunamis in the Pacific, we can predict in time for the people to evacuate to do all kinds of uh, assessment. For the local you know, tsunami, what we call local, like in Japan or, or the people in, in, in Sumatra for the Indian Ocean tsunami, that's still remaining to be a huge challenge. And that's, that's another sort of part of the, uh, of the, of the big story, I would say, that, that, uh, that we need to develop the forecast so it can become part of the tsunami warning operations. And it's not all of the warning operations, that's only part of it. There is, you know, the three important components of the, of the tsunami warning should come together to make it more and more, you know, very, very efficient. It's, uh, it's forecast, it's, this, it's where the science is. It's uh, uh, planning. For the for the for the warning uh, operations and education of people who are actually at risk. So when these three components come together, then you can save everybody. That's, and that's again should be a good challenge for us all. And for to to address this, this for for everybody and the main, main uh, uh, exposure is for people locally. Of course, we have to uh, improve our forecast quite a bit, and that's. If, that means that we need to improve all the components of that. We need to speed up the models. We need to make sure that the models are put together in, in, uh, and, and analyzed in an automatic way so that we don't spend time there. And, and, and that can reduce the, uh, let me go back, the, the, the latency. We now have the capability, which is not implemented yet. Again, we spent all this, all this 10 years to, to implement the science into the capability of about one hour forecast. If we, uh, we have now technology to, to cut it down to 15 minute forecast. And again, that's the new challenge that we have for the forecast uh, 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 community, for the scientific community here. And that's, that's we, uh, the, uh, the, the reason for, say, for us in NOAA, uh, that this is very important, is that Cascadia Subduction Zone uh, provides quite a bit of, uh, 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 of challenge, let's say, for, for our warning operations and the way the, the green dots, which is observation and capability that we have right now, green, green triangles, indicate that, that, that show this, this graph show that we can get the data from potential tsunami that, that will eventually happen in about 20 to, to 30 minutes. And again, we, we can produce forecast for, for, the, you know, for, the, for the Hawaii in very well, but to do the forecast in time for, to one population uh, uh, with, with forecast locally, uh, we, we should place the new capability, new detection capability, very close to, this, to, the, uh, uh, to the potential source. That's what the, the, Kenji showed they do in Japan with cable system, uh, the system that, we, that, that uh, the other system that's developed in, in, in US, the, the new generation of DART K, have the capability to do it in, with, with different uh, instruments, but the goal is the same, to measure it right away and, and to cut the, the modeling capability, modeling forecast in, uh, from, from hours to, to just minutes or, or even seconds. So that's, that's all I had. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, we're... Oh. Um, hi, I'm Chris Gorski with Inside Science. Um, I was just wondering if the NOAA forecasts factor in the sort of reflection effects that Dr. Padaracci was talking about. That's a good. That's a good question. Uh, what what Chari you know, what, what Chari described uh, is is a, is a, actually it's a very um, interesting and new scientific knowledge that that we obtain after the event, and uh, the uh, so the short answer is yes, but there is a longer answer. The, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> And the longer answer is that this, this, this reflected wave come hours and hours after the, uh, uh, um, uh, after the, uh, the main impact, let's put it this way, after the first direct wave came to the coastline. And the reason it's a challenge for the forecast is that the longer the forecast models run, the more errors they accumulate. So to, to predict this, uh, this reflected wave is a huge challenge. So we, we, the, uh, our capability does include that, but the accuracy of this later wave prediction is, is, is a challenge. So while we, do, we know pretty well what is the accuracy of our first impact waves, it's about, so we still have about 20 to 30% error if we have uh, the models based on the observations, uh, which means 
you know, it's 70% accurate again. To put it in, in, in perspective is that it means that we can predict the flooding of tsunami very well. Okay, we can still, you know, the, the maximum amplitude is still not quite the same necessarily as, as observation, but flooding we can predict very well. With reflected wave, we don't know the accuracy of that. That's, sorry, that's the long answer. Any other questions? Holger Kroker, Planet Editor for Vasily. Uh, the flooding models for the target regions, for how many regions did you do them? on the U.S. coast, right. or is it for all the coasts already done? Uh, the, the capability for high resolution flooding forecast right now, we have only for the uh, most vulnerable uh, U.S. coastal communities. The, the challenge, of course, the one that I put forth is that it has to be a global capability. And, for, and, and that's, again, technologically is possible. What needs to be done is you know, to put this science again into, into uh, products. So we know by itself, or I by itself, or, or, or Kenji by, by, by himself can, cannot, cannot do that. You know, it needs to be, again, uh, uh, capability developed by, uh, um, by, by the whole com scientific community, tsunami community, and it's based on standards also. To make it useful, we can, we can uh, sorry, again, I'm going to a long answer there, but, but the standards and, and global involvement, I think it's the key to have the global coverage, which absolutely has to be the goal, and we are not there yet. Yeah, I'd like to emphasize that <clears throat> the current DART array, uh, there are nine countries that are participating, and uh, this is sort of the roots of tsunami warning in the Pacific in that each country would set up an observational capability and share with the other countries. And so what we're seeing unfolding here in the last decade is these other countries buying and supplementing what the U.S. has put out and the, and the U.S. gains because they're spending their own resources and supplying data. For example, in 2011, there were three DART buoys that, that detected the tsunami first. There were two, two American buoys and one Russian. And the Russians shared their data with us, and we use that for our forecast. So we think over time, as other countries accept the challenge of, of um, dealing with the risk of tsunami, that there'll be more uh, deep ocean observational systems put in place. And now they have a choice. They can do it by a cable observatory, or they can do it by buoy. And uh, we expect that to grow. Uh, and at the same time, international cooperation is growing. Uh, Kit Stoltz, uh, Santa Barbara Independent. What are the most vulnerable U.S. Uh, communities? That's a very good question, and, and, uh, and I don't know the answer that specifically for that. I can tell you that uh, we have the list of 75 communities. It's 75. Uh, co communities. It's, it's a long list. I don't remember all of them by by uh, uh, by heart. The Hawaii, of course, is. Uh, you know, I can I can give you some of my uh, non-scientific uh, uh, sort of uh, answer based on my intuition, which is based on 30 years of research in, in tsunami. Though, uh, so Hawaii definitely is is comes to mind because uh, they they pretty much receive tsunami from uh, um, from from every Pacific uh, uh, earthquake. But even Hawaii, they're not uniformly uh, uh, hazardous for any, any community. Different communities have different response, interestingly. You know that Hilo is, is, is one of the tsunami magnets, so to say. On the mainland, uh, uh, Crescent City is known, is, is known to attract quite a bit of energy. And, and what Eddie showed in terms of, uh, showed the, uh, uh, this, this global forecast, which, which shows that the energy does not propagate uniformly. So for some reason, uh, well, actually, we know th those reasons. Uh, uh, Crescent City, for example, attracts a lot of energy from, from many different sources. But, but Alaska is by far the most seismically active part of the United States. So Alaska would be number one, Cascadia, and Hawaii would be two, and Cascadia three, if you were, were to rank them in terms of probability of, of, <coughs> of damage. Uh, 1964 earthquake in Alaska certainly uh, told us what was going on. So. So, and, you know, maybe to add, we, that's the reason I, I didn't want to single on one community. After this, 
terrible events of the last decade, we know that pretty much any coastline, you have to be aware of the, of the danger. So if, if you say this, there's one community that's much more dangerous than others, I think it's, it, it's, it's a bit of misleading information. We really, the, any coastline is vulnerable, and both in terms of the potential sources and, and uh, uh, you know, potential impact on this coastline. Hi, Becky Oskin, Live Science. I'm wondering if you're still seeing the same levels of uh, commitment in terms of financing and investment from the various partner countries now as you did right after the tsunami or whether there's been a drop off and whether you're having to struggle a little bit more to get all of these boys funded and continued support for the system. Um, we were talking about this before this press conference, and um, I think the um, one way to think about the contributions from countries is um, brainware, that's talent. And uh, the scientific community of tsunami scientists has exploded since 2004. There was probably 100 tsunami scientists in the world before 2004, now there's at least 1,000. And those investments are made by countries by training and by, and especially the Indian Ocean nations where people experienced it. There's a whole generation now of scientists who are dedicated to this problem. So in my um, estimate, that's the biggest investment every, anybody's made. They've, they've taken the human capital and said, work on this problem. And they set up warning systems. Now, in 2004, there was only one in the Pacific. Now they're in the um, Indian Ocean, and they're setting, they've set up one in the Mediterranean. They're setting up one. So nations are investing um, based on these two large tsunamis in 2004 and 2011. The estimated cost to Japan was about $200 billion. And they are now uh, looking at an earthquake in the Nankai Trough, which is the south part of Japan. And their estimates of the damage from that one could exceed $2 trillion. So for them to make an investment of $300 million for a cabled observatory seems balanced in the economics of this problem. But more importantly, Japan suffered um, um, what I think is an interruption of their economy. It took about 2% off their gross domestic product for one year because just-in-time manufacturing was shut down in large parts of it. So the economic impacts of tsunami are just now being realized. And I think as time goes by, we'll find that that $4 billion in assets exposed each year is a gross underestimate. So, because if you think about the way our society functions, it's, it's everything goes into a port and then it's distributed. Okay, destroy the port, what happens? Okay, there's a big interruption. So we live in a, we're living in, uh, in a very complex society which is so dependent on certain elements of it and the port system is a very important element of that of the e equilibrium in the global economy. And so I'm sympathetic to what you're saying but I was thinking not of the Japan tsunami but of the Indian Ocean tsunami and the handover of the system there that's ha going to be happening to the countries and so what do you think is going to happen now? with in the system country. in the Indian Ocean? Well, in the Indian Ocean, well, the, there are th uh, three tsunami warning systems, uh, one by India, one by Indonesia, and one by Australia. Uh, and they're combined, and they talk to each other. So they are sustaining that. Uh, in addition to, they have the Dart Boys, What's also happening is that with the tsunami warning system, as you say, it's not that much of the, the, the financial thing. It is, it is the, also the response of the people, uh, that they become complacent, etc. But they do regular exercises every year or twice a year. They do what you call Indian Ocean Wave, that they go through the warning system all the way to how the get warning gets down to the people and educating the people of what to do. So those sort of exercises keep people on their toes, if you like, and the awareness to keep going. Any other questions? 
um, as far as I remember, you were talking about far field tsunamis. What about near field tsunamis? Or are you considering the Tohoku uh, example as a near field? For the US case? Right? For the, you're asking uh, yeah, for US? Yeah, yeah, so for yes. the, what, what is the question exactly? Um, it's Tohoku or near, near field tsunami? Yes. 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 <laughs> oh, it's Tohoku or so, near field so, tsunami. So, so you are it. developing forecasting models for near field tsunamis as well, or only far field? Oh, the, uh, for both. Absolutely for both. The, the challenge that I emphasize there that the, you know, the capability, the technical capability exists to, to do both. You need to well, not capability. Scientific uh, technology, the technology exists to do both, we can, and we've we've tested it for local and and far field tsunamis. To put it into capability, it's uh, you know that's 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 a different proposition. It's it's putting the science into operation. That's what the challenge is. So while we know how to do that, it's we we're not done with that yet, and that goes back to the budget question because the the, the, the you know to do the local forecast. Effectively, Kenji showed that, that the, the observation system, this vast observation system that Japan is developing, that's the order of magnitude observation that you need and, and the speed that you need to do that. And that's quite a bit of investment, both in you know, scientific uh, development and, and budgets also. So that's, both of these are a challenge. Well, to answer that if the Tohoku is near field, yeah, it is near field to Japan, yeah. but that's far field source for the US. Okay. And for the, for the U.S., the near field uh, source will be Cascadia, Cascadia subduction zone. And they will be far field for Japan. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? <coughs> Any questions from the chat? Okay, that concludes our press conference. Thank you.